play ball for the last few years, and we know you're probably smarter than your grades would indicate. Um, and that's when they let me know about the program. The program was laser refractive surgery. It began quietly in 1993 as an experiment. Captain Butler had convinced the Navy command that it offered two enormous benefits. It would free combat troops from glasses or contacts, and it could greatly expand the pool of eligible talent. Wouldn't it be great if we could fix their refractive error and capture all of these great athletes and great leaders into our community? With the go-ahead from the Navy, the next step was to set up a clinical trial. That took Captain Butler to the Naval Medical Center in San Diego, where he met Captain Steve Schauhorn. Frank Butler and I connected, and, and we connected in many different ways, because he was a full Navy SEAL before he went into medical school and became an ophthalmologist. I was a Navy pilot. I flew F-14s. I was a Top Gun instructor before I went into medical school and went into ophthalmology. And Frank had the vision to say, this could be of great benefit. The clinical study belonged to Dr. Shellhorn. He did 30 patients, and the results from Dr. Shellhorn's study were spectacular. All 30 of the patients had 20-20 vision or better after the surgery, after having had very bad vision pre-op. His results were excellent. Looks good, Paul, looks real good. In the civilian community, the FDA was also conducting clinical trials. Those results were equally impressive. And I moved beyond that. Environmental concerns and issues that the military had unique to their population, like high altitude, high G, hyperbaria, underwater, blowing sand conditions. It was amazing how well uh, folks did uh, that, that in all the environmental studies that we looked at. Not only did Dr. Schalhorn test the SEAL's vision before and after surgery, he also looked at their job performance. And what do we find? Better performance after laser vision correction. Well, better is a good thing, and that's why I was like, dude, this is pretty darn awesome. And all the studies lined up very similar to that. By 1997, the Navy's Special Warfare Command was making the surgery available to all active duty SEALs and offering it to outstanding SEAL candidates. One of them was Clint Bruce. I remember sitting with my classmates and they said, you know, Bruce, Naval Special Warfare. And I, it, was, it, was, it was pretty overwhelming. Captain Butler had decided to give me a waiver that it had become available for the special operations community on a test basis, and that if I made it through training, they would have given me an opportunity to go through the, go through the procedure. But at least this time, you won't be dependent on glasses. It wasn't the long before the word was out about the program and the SEAL's new fighting edge. At Fort Bragg, ophthalmic surgeon Colonel Scott Barnes began looking at the potential of refractive surgery for the Army Special Forces. Some of these classified units that don't exist, but if they did exist, they interact with Navy uh, SEALs, Navy Special Operators, and they talk about what, what's going on. Hey, how'd you get this? What do you mean you don't wear glasses anymore? And these classified units are really the elite of the elite. They are really catered to because they do some very difficult, very tough things. And so when they kind of start pushing, saying, hey, we want this laser surgery, um, it caught the ears of the senior people that, that kind of run the show in the Army, and they said, hey, we need to pay attention because they think this thing is going to make a difference for them. Since then, the Army has enthusiastically embraced laser refractive surgery. It's estimated that over the past 10 years, more than 200,000 soldiers have had the procedure. One of the first was Dr. Barnes himself. That's great, almost finished. Having a soldier put his life on the line and come back and say, thank you, because I can see and I did my job, and I came back to my family and my children because I saw through that ambush because you did surgery on me. Priceless. The operational forces, the people that go into harm's way, the aviators, the Marines, they pretty clearly saw the advantages. It became pretty apparent to me that those same advantages, and maybe even more, and in a different way, would be applicable to naval aviators. And so I became interested in looking at the, the aviation side of laser vision correction very, very early on. The whole concept of refractive surgery actually began 50 years earlier 
as an effort to improve the vision of pilots. In the days leading up to the Second World War, Japan was building the world's largest air force, amassing thousands of warplanes. But they didn't have enough qualified pilots. An unusually large proportion, 44% of Japanese, are myopic or nearsighted. Myopia is caused by a cornea that is too curved for the length of the eye or an elongated eyeball. This causes light to focus in front of the retina instead of on the retina. The Japanese war ministry named Tomatsu Sato, a well-known ophthalmologist and researcher, to find a way to treat myopia. Sato made incisions into the cornea, causing it to flatten. This, he reasoned, would move the focus to the correct point on the retina. Although he had some success, his results were too inconsistent and interest in refractive surgery ended with the Japanese war effort. And people will see the beautiful field. It was revived 30 years later when a flamboyant Russian ophthalmologist, Satislav Fyodorov, announced he had developed a cure for myopia. Dr. Fyodorov's approach was to make a series of cuts radiating from the center of the cornea, producing a controlled amount of correction a procedure he called radial keratotomy. He set up clinics across the Soviet Union with hundreds of technicians, each trained to do just one specific step of the procedure. The results of his radial keratotomy, or RK as it came to be known, were basically good, but not always predictable. About a third of his patients were overcorrected or undercorrected. RK all but disappeared when in 1980, the National Eye Institute issued a public warning about its safety and effectiveness. That prompted the Department of Defense to ban RK and all forms of refractive surgery for members of the U.S. Armed Forces. The military's ban remained in effect for nearly 15 years until Butler and Schallhorn convinced the Navy that a new form of refractive surgery was worth consideration. PRK, or photorefractive keratectomy, was a totally new approach. It used a laser to reshape the cornea instead of a scalpel. The cornea is protected by a thin layer of epithelial cells which must be removed before the laser can be applied. Each pulse of laser energy is computer-guided to a predetermined spot in the treatment zone where it removes a minute portion of corneal tissue. After thousands of pulses, the result is a precisely reshaped cornea, slightly flatter, bringing the myopic eye into focus. In the civilian community, early trials showed even patients with high levels of refractive errors were achieving excellent results with PRK. One of the largest clinical trials of the procedure was the Navy's accessioning study conducted by Captain Schallhorn. 700 candidates who failed the vision standards for naval aviation were treated with PRK and then allowed into flight training. And we followed and tracked them through flight training and compared them to their peers at the end of that study. In that comparison, we found that people that had PRK actually did better. And one important one was they had a lower what we call attrition rate. Their dropout rate was less. And that is very significant because it costs an awful lot to train a naval aviator. So not only what, did that study allow a wider pool of applicants in to become Navy pilots, which is of, of great benefit, but it also had cost savings associated with it. So that study was, was phenomenally successful in that respect. Despite the glowing results, Captain Schallhorn wasn't ready to recommend PRK for naval aviators. PRK has what I call an Achilles heel. It has a, a major issue for aviation, and that is slow visual recovery. It takes time. It can take weeks, sometimes months, to get the excellent vision that we want after PRK. That has great implication for aviation. So LASIK offers faster visual recovery. So if we can get an aviator, what we call back in the cockpit faster, it's a huge benefit. And not only to the aviator, but also in a cost-saving sense, because to requalify an aviator can be very expensive depending on how far outside of a week that aviator is from having landed on an aircraft carrier. 
It takes a while for the epithelial cells on the surface